Hi all, welcome back to my channel. I'm Ollie and this is Simply Stitchy. I'm a full-time blogger and a YouTuber obsessed with sewing. This channel is where I share my passion for sewing through tutorials, how-to hints and sewing tips. I collect and have been known to sew from vintage patterns and new ones when I get a spare five minutes and have an ever-increasing collection of vintage sewing machines. My videos cover the machines, the sewing, the patterns and sometimes I'll throw in a little bit of history to boot. In today's video I'm pitting the UK against the USA and going head to head with two Singer 15s. In the red, white and blue corner representing the UK we have Roger Wilco. He's a Singer 15K80 from Kilbowie, Clydebank, Scotland. You've met Roger before. He's starred in another couple of videos I did on the Singer 15 a few weeks back which I'll put links in the description box below for you. You probably think Roger Wilco is a bit of a strange name for a sewing machine. But then sewing machines with names is a bit odd really isn't it? But he's actually named after um, the call sign that pilots used to say. Um, obviously because he's got RAF decals, the call sign Roger Wilco or Roger will comply was what the pilots used to say when they were you know, up in the air, flying around. I think the modern equivalent to that is copy that. Um, it was either call him that or call him septic, which would have been after the name of one of the pilots in the film Angels 1-5, which was about an RAF squadron in World War II. Um, he was called septic as in wounds going septic rather than in septic tank, which... <laughs> Next. In the red, white and blue corner, representing the USA, we have the Singer 1591. A sleek, fully electric model from 1952 um, and she was built in Elizabethport, New Jersey. Um, it's a 1952 but uh, I don't think that's a, a centennial badge because it doesn't actually say centennial on it. Um, even though this is a 1952 model the, um, the start of the serial number, AL, shows on Ismax, the website where you can date Singer sewing machines, a link for which I'll put in the description box below, shows this as being a machine that was released in 1953. Now, Singer, being Singer, stopped putting the Centennial badge on the sewing machines towards the end of 1952 because they didn't want people to think that they were last year's models. Now you're probably wondering why both of my corners are red, white and blue. Well, apart from both the UK and the US having red, white and blue flags, both these machines are technically American. Isaac Singer was an American and the Singer Sewing Machine Company is an American company. This one, however, was built at Singer's largest sewing machine factory in Kilbowie Clydebank in Scotland, which wasn't just Singer's largest factory, it was actually the largest sewing machine factory in the world. Um, it was at one point close to a million square feet of space with approximately 7,000 employees and they were producing 13,000 sewing machines every week. That's a lot of sewing machines. They were so productive in fact that the American Singer Company formed the Singer Manufacturing Company Limited and registered it as a UK company back in 1905. Unfortunately the company closed in 1980 and the factory was actually demolished in 1998 but they do still have a Singer sewing machine museum up there so if you're ever in the Clydebank area it's well worth popping in and having a visit on that. If you want to know more information about the history of the Singer sewing machines um, obviously check out the Ismax website, links below, and another website you can check out is the singersewinginfo.co.uk website. I'll pop that link down below for you as well. Now if you haven't already done so it would be a great time to subscribe to my channel. If you click the little button and then ring that little bell so that YouTube will let you have a notification next time I upload a video and you'll make sure that way that you don't miss any um, future ones that I upload. Um, I'm still working on 
a couple of series of videos. One's on how to use electric sewing machines. The other one, this series, is looking at sewing machines and how they've changed over the years since Grandma was built in 1912 and also doing a series on sewing patterns. But let's get back to today's. Let's have a look at what makes these two similar machines and what makes them different. Now because both of these machines were made by the same company, albeit on different sides of the Atlantic, what we're essentially looking at is the difference between a 1950s model and a 1952. First of all, let's have a look at just how I know that these two are Singer 15s. And the answer to that lies at the front of both. If you take a look at the tension discs, they're both situated on the side of the face plate, which is a telling sign that these are both Singer 15s. Also, on the front of this one, we've got, whoops a daisy, oh, that's better. We've got two thread guides at the top of the thread, uh, face plate, and we've also got um, like an engraved design. Whereas on this one, we've only got one thread guide at the top, and we've got more of a sleek kind of stylish, plain design. It's like it's it's got um, ridges on it rather than scrolls and squirrels. Now this second um, thread guide on the 1950s model is actually useful if, I don't know if you can see on both machines, they've got like a little bobbin thread spool st stand right at the base here. Sometimes this goes missing and obviously because of the need to thread a bobbin so you can use the sewing machine, you need to be able to keep tension on the thread so that it's it doesn't wind the bobbin in a sloppy fashion. So if that's missing what you can do is you can use the thread stand that's on the top of the machine but it'd be a bit of a pain having to come to this thread guide um, over here which is the one we use to thread the needle because it's it's going against itself so what you do is you bring it across to this one and then down to the bobbin tensioner and then up to the bobbin. There's no little hook in the middle of the faceplate for the 1591. The thread guide is on the bottom right hand corner of the faceplate. This makes getting the thread to the bobbin a lot easier. Or, well, maybe not losing the bobbin spool holder in the first place would work even better. If we take a look at the, the back of the machine, so you'll notice that obviously this one's the hand crank and this one's electric. And if you look at the size difference of the hand wheels, because this one is powered by hand, it obviously has a larger wheel. But because this one relies on electric, it doesn't really need a large wheel. And that's why that one is so much smaller. And you can see the um, electrical connection at the base here. And you can tell that this is a 91 because it's got the potted motor. If this was a 1590, the motor would be on the side down here. Now you can probably tell that there's a bit missing from this one. Um, Roger Wilco here has got um, a wooden base. This one on the other hand would have been at one point in a cabinet and I can tell that because of these that you can't see. Hang on a minute. These are the hinges that would have attached it to a cabinet. Um, obviously it's been taken off the cabinet at some point in the past. Um, this is a close-up of what a potted motor looks like. Another thing where these two machines differ, even though they're the same Model 15s, um, this one has only got a stitch length adjuster, which changes the length of your stitches. Whereas this one has got not just the stitch length adjuster, but it's also got reverse. Um, the reverse is a little bit of a pain on this one though, in that you put it, you have to push that up to get it into reverse, and then you have to remember to take it out of reverse before you try and stitch forwards, because otherwise you'll just keep going backwards. It's not like modern machines where you push a button 
and you go backwards then take your finger off the button and it stops going backwards not only that but this dial doubles up it's not just where you go to get to put it into reverse you've also got your different stitch widths and that's where you change that as well and you probably noticed it's got little numbers on it whereas the other one doesn't have any numbers on it at all you have to guess another place where it differs slightly is this is the 1950s um, front and you see the tension discs they don't have any numbers or markings on them so again you have to guess what the tension setting is and if I just slowly move over to the other one for a minute and down the tension discs on the model from 1952 have got numbers so no longer do you have to guess what setting to put it on you just follow whatever number matches what you want to do another slight difference is the bobbin housing this is the one on the 1950s machine again if I just slowly go across to the other one that's what the bobbin housing looks like on the 1952 machine so you can see some of the improvements that have started to come through and what you can also tell is actually the bobbin on that one is pointing a different way can you see that just there that little finger that's on the 1952 and on the 1950s one it's on the other side see that now I've taken the bobbins out of both machines just to see if I can make that a little bit clearer for you this is the bobbin from out of the 1950s machine and this is the bobbin from out of oops out of the 1952 machine so they're like back to front aren't they this one's lever pulls up that way and this one's lever goes that way that difference with the bobbins um, is one of the reasons why I always say if you're looking to buy a second hand sewing machine you make sure that the bobbin housing the bobbin case and the bobbin for that particular machine are all present because there are so many different types of bobbins and bobbin cases out there that you need to make sure that it comes with the machine because otherwise you're going to have a headache like no other trying to work out which parts fit which machines it's possible but if you get the machine with the bits in the first place, it's a headache that you don't need to have. I'll be covering what to look for um, and what things your machine definitely needs to have uh, when you're buying a second hand machine in a little bit more detail in a later video. So if you haven't already, subscribe to my channel so you don't miss that one when it gets uploaded. I hope you liked today's video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. Let me know in the comments about your sewing adventures with these older vintage machines or even modern machines um, I'd like to hear about your sewing adventures too and if you have any questions drop me a note in the comments I do try to get back to them as soon as I can if all things sewing is one of your passions don't forget to subscribe and why not check out some of my other videos you'll see a couple of links coming up on the screen any minute now like magic gonna look a bit silly if they don't pop up straight away now aren't I <laughs> whatever the top one is one that YouTube thinks you might like to see next and the bottom one is one that I think you might like to see next. Whichever one you do go and check out, I hope to see you back here for the next one. But in the meantime, wherever you're sewing, whatever you're sewing with, embrace your creativity and have fun. Thank you ever so much for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.